This pavilion stands on the former German front line and looks out to the west onto the elevated Allied front line. These positions were captured in the course of November 1914 and remained practically unchanged until the 7th of June 1917. This hilly area, called Hollebeck Ridge, lies about 50 metres above sea level and was intersected in the second half of the 19th century by two major public works that defined the frontline landscape of the First World War at this place. One kilometre to the north lies the battlefield of Hill 60. Around 1847, the ypres comines cotric railway line was constructed. The soil from that railway cutting was used to raise the railway embankments at four different locations. During the war, each of these mounds of earth was given its own name. From north to south, these are larch wood, The dump, which was called La Butte de Tirailleur by the French. Hill 60 and the high winding slope of the Caterpillar. The names given by the British show enormous inventiveness. Here where we are now standing, the ridge was intersected for the construction of the Ypres Commune Canal. Despite various attempts over many decades, no boat would ever sail on it. The story of the so-called Old Canal is told elsewhere in the province's annals. However, here too, mounds were also formed as a result of the canal works. The Allied position before us is the largest of these. West of us, this high bank, which the British called the Bluff, descends to the canal itself, where important work was carried out. Here, for example, we can still see the remnants of the canal building, with locks and water reservoirs. The canal works failed due to geophysical reasons traces of which are still visible today. The soil here consists of layers that slide over each other, which means that the German front line falls further away in the direction of the canal. However, the canal project also failed due to lack of space. This was because the owner of the Chateau Mayeux estate on the other side of the canal did not want to sell very much land. Before the war, Chateau Mayeux was the largest and most beautiful of the many estates in the region. The war arrived in this particular landscape of small and large obstacles on about the 20th of October 1914. Initially, the positions were defended by the British cavalry, supported by a brigade of Indian infantry. From the 31st of October, the French took over the front line. Bavarian troops succeeded in occupying the chateau grounds in early November 1914. French Zouaves, Chasseurs and Infantry extended their front line at right angles to the canal and on the railway at Hill 60. Hill 60 itself only fell into German hands on the 10th of December 1914. It was the last piece of the Ypres salient that was formed. In the days that followed, the French mounted large-scale counter-attacks with fixed bayonets. Their attacks, however, were always repulsed by the German troops, with an extremely high loss of life. It would be done primarily by undermining the enemy front line. A few days before Christmas 1914, 
the French detonated three small mines at Hill 60. When the British took over the sector from the French in January 1950, a mine war began that would last for two and a half years. In turn, the Germans captured the high ground at Saint Eloi, southwest of the Chateau Mayeur estate, with the detonation of two mines on the 14th of March 1915. The British countered at Hill 60 on the 17th of April 1915. As a result, the hill was temporarily held by the British 5th Division. Two gas attacks on the 1st and 5th of May 1915 forced the British to retreat to their former front line. The fruitless attempts to capture Hill 60 cost more than 800 lives. A total of 50 mines would be detonated in the Hill 60 sector, without the front lines really changing. No man's land would only become a little bit wider and increasingly accessible as a result of the accumulation of mine craters, most of which are still visible today. The situation was no different at St. Eloi. In 1915, 30 near-surface mine explosions, 20 German and 10 British, transformed the area into one enormous crater landscape. On the 27th of March 1916, the British went on the attack after detonating six deep mines. The British 3rd Division was initially successful but when the front line was handed over to the still inexperienced 2nd Canadian Division, the ground gained had to be conceded again. Once again, many hundreds of lives were lost. land between the German front line and the British front line 150 meters away on the bluff also continues to show the scars of the relentless underground warfare. In July 1915 German Minera or miners attempted for the first time to blow up the British position at the bluff. And later on, another 12 mines were detonated. A successful German infantry attack followed three mine explosions on the 1st of February 1916. The German 124th Infantry Regiment took over the bluff. As a result, the British garrison that occupied the bluff, the 10th Sherwood Foresters, suffered hundreds of casualties, including 143 deaths. On the 2nd of March 1916, the British 17th Division was able to recapture the bluff, albeit at the cost of more than 300 lives. Several British cemeteries are testimony 
to the continued fighting for the strategic high ground in the vicinity. The mine warfare continued here unabated, but without subsequent infantry attacks. The bluff was almost completely blown up on the 15th of July 1916. The explosion turned the artificial mound of soil from the old railway cutting into a massive kidney-shaped crater just behind the British front line. The bluff would continue to exist, but hardly as a strategic threat. In December 1916, the British tunnelers dismantled further German tunnelling works. They were to be the last mines at this location, but not in the sector. The underground war reached its climax with the Battle of the Messine Ridge on the 7th of June 1917. The mine war that until now had been of only local tactical importance was now part of a great battle. From early 1916, hundreds of tunnelers in the British Army were deployed to lay 25 huge mines on a front that stretched over 15 kilometres between Hill 60 in the north and Plushtees Wood in the south.